Hey everybody, welcome to Life on Life's Terms. This is episode 28. Uh, you have your host Kenny here, and I have a very special person to introduce to you today. The great, the powerful, the wise, Howie Hoggins, a dear friend of mine. Uh, this individual has played a huge role in my life. He's a mentor, a friend, and a daily source of inspiration. Uh, say say hello, Howie. Introduce yourself, and please, if you can, give us a, a little bio, maybe uh, some of your past, uh, how it brought you to where you are today, and, and maybe some some uh, views on where you plan on taking your life in the future. Great. Well, hello, everybody. Yes, Howie Hoggins, and thank you, Kenny. Uh, I was born and raised in the little town of Vegreville, Alberta, and I have that uh, small town attitude still etched deeply in my uh, mind. Uh, I love connecting uh, with people on a personal level. So uh, there's where I was born. I went on to uh, university at the University of Alberta. I really thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. I had this passion for uh, taking care of animals and connecting to animals. And then I got a reality check. I actually got to volunteer in a vet clinic and I said, uh, yeah, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And uh, it is in line with this uh, saying I have the idea or notion of something is quite different from the experience. I decided that uh, it was not going to be in my best interest to uh, have animals that died uh, during surgery or they would bring animals in and they'd say, you know, we don't want this dog anymore. Can you put them down? And wouldn't be able to handle that part of it. Didn't have so, the heart, eh? No, just wasn't in me. Just yeah. wasn't in me. So I, I did pre-vet in university and then I switched into zoology. I thought, well, that's a little bit easier to deal with and I was really, really uh, passionate about working with animals. While I was doing my training, I got an opportunity to get involved in volunteer work. And one of the uh, volunteer organizations I work with was the Edmonton Association for Children and Adults with Learning Disabilities. And I thought, this is cool. I'm going to get to help people read, write. And I work with people that had all kinds of reading problems. I started with a gentleman who had really severe dyslexia and really wasn't getting anywhere and wanted to achieve more in his life. And I said, well, let's, let's just do this. I had discovered my true passion. I love to teach, love to facilitate, and worked with the gentleman for about four years and got him to a point where he could uh, read and write at about a grade six level, which allowed him to take some tests in his profession and go uh, up, if you will, advance, and I was really, really excited for him. And I decided, you know, this is, this is really what I want. So after I got my zoology degree, I said, I'm gonna go into education, I wanna be a teacher. So I got an after degree in uh, education, and my specialty was uh, psychology, biology, and special education. And my first teaching assignment was in the toughest, roughest school in all of Alberta. I started out in W.P. Wagner High School, when it was a very scary place for some people. For me, it wasn't. It was an opportunity to make a difference. And that's what I yeah. discovered. It was really important to me. And so I started there, had a blast, uh, connected to a lot of amazing people, uh, got an opportunity to teach a variety of uh, subjects, psychology, science. Uh, I even got into horticulture and taught some uh, horticulture there. Anyway, it just really established that this is what I wanted to do. So I went from there. Um, actually, what I did there, I have to, start to say this, this, is really cool. I started a zoo in W.P. Wagner High School. Yes, that's true, a zoo. I got a license for a zoo, the same license that the Calgary Zoo has and the Valley Zoo has. And I started to put together a collection of animals and use those animals really to teach students about animals, about caring for animals, and about being compassionate. Just about and the ebb and great. flow of life, oh, right? You know, uh, awesome. Bring them into all different sorts yep. of teaching. And a lot of students didn't relate really well, but if you had an animal as a bridge, it was amazing. Like a, a kid that would hardly say five words, and you put something like a ferret in his hands, all of a sudden he's just asking all these questions, wants to know everything there is to know about ferrets. And it was an opportunity to connect to people, to, to teach, and give them an opportunity as well, too, to learn about themselves and learn about some of the passions they had. Uh, from there, I went to Jasper Place High School. I was invited to come over there to expand the zoo. And the W.P. Wagner Zoo turned into the Jasper Place High School Zoo. I had a, an entire section on the second floor of the tower. If you know Jasper Place High School, very, very large school, accommodates about 2,200 students. 
There's a tower on the back end, the office is on the main floor, but on the second floor, there's some uh, classrooms for business education, and then there's some old classrooms that were used for science. And I said, this will work perfectly. And I had uh, a classroom. How many, and, how many animals did you have? Well, I ended up with 120 exotic oh animals. Yeah. What was the coolest animal that you had there? Probably the coolest was the descented skunk. Uh, also a pair of monkeys. We had a pair of uh, marmoset monkeys, which were really awesome. And, and basically, I developed the whole program. I said, you know what? I'm going to need people to do this. So I worked through uh, Alberta Education under the auspices of special credits and created a pet keeper program for first year, teaching them all about all the animals that I had in there. If they came back, they were a zookeeper and they got to work with a specific group of animals and then train other pet keepers. And then the third year, they would go to the Valley Zoo and volunteer and work directly with zookeepers. So this was awesome for any students that wanted to learn more about animals or were considering a career with animals. Oh, wow. So did any of the students end up actually working at the zoo full-time? Actually, uh, my greatest claim to fame is a young lady that I consider is very much like my daughter. Uh, I've known her now for 26 years. She went there in 1993, and she is still there to this day oh, wow. as a volunteer. Yeah, wow. very, very cool. So what did you do after that? Well, uh, after that, I went, uh, I did teach there for four years, and then I, I like a challenge, so I said, you know, I've taught high school, I'd like to see what it's like to teach elementary school. The zoo program had to be downgraded anyway, so most of the animals went to the students that were involved in the program. I kept a, a group of about 25 animals that were a little bit easier to take care of, and took them with me to the next school. I went to Linmid Elementary, and I taught grade three and grade six, and I had a mini zoo in my classroom. Didn't have to have the uh, the license and everything because it was much smaller and just absolutely rocked and it was interesting because another aspect of, of who I am is I, uh, when I was a kid I used to try to do voices copy people's voices and I, I actually came up with three character voices that I developed when I was in high school I didn't do them very much at home but when I went to university I got a chance to play a little bit more and there I had these three voices well I hadn't done anything other than that and I went to elementary school and it just opened up a whole part of my brain that said, hey, there's a whole bunch more voices in here if you're willing to just let yourself be a kid and play. And in the course of that year, uh, another 40 voices came out. So, so let me get this right, for, just so our listeners can understand this. You know, like you can mimic 40 different voices. You can... Right. And what it is usually is either based on an accent. So, for example, I grew up in a community where there was a lot of Slavic people. And so very quickly, I could do this. And very quickly, you would think perhaps I am from Russia because it is possible for me to <laughs> even make sound like I speak a language. So I could go, it's absolutely gibberish, but it sounds very impressive. <laughs> so, a, yes. Do you, have, do you have a name for that character? Uh, that's Vladimir Alexandrovich. Yeah, every character has a name. Yeah, I, I ended up naming them all because this led me to a lady that did voiceover. I met her back in, oh gosh, what about 2008? And I started to do this and I started to do uh, it professionally. I got paid for radio and TV commercials. And, and sometimes, Kenny, when I hear a voice, for whatever reason, it registers and I can reproduce that voice. And it's not through any conscious effort. Um, I remember first time that happened, was uh, when I heard Cheech and Chong. We used to listen to Cheech and Chong records <laughs> in university and loved Cheech and Chong. It was so cool. And then one day, I just, I could hear Cheech talking in my head. Let's hear it. Let's hear and Cheech. And I thought, wow, that sounds like Cheech. And so I just opened my mouth and it was, hey, how's it going? Like, uh, you guys want to meet down at the barrio later? Like, maybe, you know, we could check out the senoritas and, uh, you know, have an enchilada or two, eh? <laughs> <laughs> that was and so oh, good. Oh, a crazy Cheech came out. And then another time, I, uh, my daughter had a pull toy, and it was Mickey Mouse's voice on this little Mickey Mouse pull toy. And every night, I would pull the Mickey Mouse, and out would come his voice, and then I would tell her a story. And one night, went to pull it, didn't come out, held it up, and went, Oh, hi. Hi, Mickey Mouse. Hey, Chelsea. How are you today? <laughs> and she goes, Daddy, he never said that before. Well, he's going to say a lot of things he never said before. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> That's ridiculous. I know, sound just, just like Mickey. That's... It's just insane. And uh, 
My wife, uh, I've been uh, happily married now for 40 years. We celebrated 40 years, and she's had to put up with this insanity. Well, I she actually, can't get bored of you because you're well, 40 different people. Exactly. <laughs> and now it's up to, I think the, the last time I checked, it's just around 70. What? Yeah. 70 do, you do, any, uh, do you do any female voices? Yes. Uh, Robin Williams in Mrs. Doubtfire. Again, same thing. Went to the movie. Very next day, came out, and I was with, at a friend's place, and she was just uh, having a conniption. Uh, something was not working out, and all of a sudden, just, Oh, my dear, look at you. You're having a menopausal meltdown. Oh, for heaven's sake, I don't want to have to take out a fire extinguisher, but I think you're going to burst into flames and chill out. <laughs> and there it was. Uh, I, I can honestly say to you guys, like, I've heard him say all these before, so I'm sorry for for pretending like I, I've never. But it every time I hear it, it's beautiful. It's like it, first time I ever hear it. You don't expect this person to come up with these voices like that. Like yeah, it, so it surprises good. even me. And I have to say, uh, a character voice can come out in a split second. It happened one time when I was phoning my wife at work. I was just going to phone her to check in to see when she was coming home, start supper, and I had no intention of creating a voice. And she answered the phone. She was working at a local IGA and she answered the phone and I opened my mouth and, hello. And she said, hi, who is this? Oh, this is Bob, Bob Codger. <laughs> and she goes, hi, Bob, how can I help you? And Bob just kept talking. <laughs> and I, I, I told her that I had, uh, I said, I need a couple of things, just two things, and I'm going to come and pick them up. So I wonder if you could set them off to the side. Could you do that for me? And my wife said, yeah, I could do that, Bob. And what do you need? Uh, do I need to write it down? No, no, you can remember. I'm pretty sure it's real easy. I said, I need Trojan condoms and crunchy peanut butter. And she lost it. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, Howie? And I said, yes, dear. She said, who? I said, Bob Codger. What gave it away? The crunchy peanut butter? Uh, yeah, it was that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, so that's the, the thing I do for fun. Uh, I haven't done a lot of voiceover in the last few years, probably uh, about half a dozen years. But uh, my, my goal is to get back into doing that. So yeah, I, uh, I did that for, for a while on the side and did about 120 radio and TV commercials and just had fun with it. Uh, Back to where I went from teaching, I went from elementary school. I said, wow, I haven't had a junior high experience. So then I went and taught a junior high. Amazing, and took another group of animals. And then from there, uh, had uh, some very interesting experiences. Uh, that last year I was teaching at uh, the junior high school. I was involved in an accident, and that accident resulted in a minor brain injury. The brain injury was pretty minor. It wasn't a big deal, but what happened after was I ended up coming in contact with a virus that went into my brain and became viral meningitis. And that caused some really, really serious stuff. I actually came very close to leaving this plane of reality. I uh, experienced um, some of the worst uh, anger, depression, uh, mood swings, everything. My poor wife didn't know what was going on. I didn't know for the longest time what had happened. It, I ended up having to go have some treatments at a... Um, chiropractic clinic and he said you know we're gonna do some x-rays and when he looked at the x-rays he said oh my gosh your spine is all over the place and you you had an infection what you, yeah you, had, uh, you, you also had a uh, severe memory loss for a while right that's right yeah what, what, happened what was, was that like like what what did you what were the feelings that you had when you couldn't remember something and like how did you feel about that can you go into that well initially it was fear and then the type of person i am though i i really quickly shift to okay Let's focus on something positive and that this is going to turn around. But initially, yeah, it was scary because I'll never forget. I woke up in the morning and I felt very strange and I looked around and I really didn't have conscious awareness of where I was. Went to the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and it was the strangest, surreal experience. I looked and I thought, I have no idea who you are. That must be me, but I don't know who me is. Wow. And I was then there was this surge of, oh my gosh, what's happened? And I went downstairs, and my wife said, good morning, how are you doing? And I said, well, this is going to be kind of strange, but I don't actually remember you. And she said, come on, 
is this, you know, one of your funny things? I said, no. I said, I don't know who I am, really, and I'm not sure who you are. I know that I know you and that you're important to me, but I'm not sure who you are. And uh, she kind of broke down a bit, and then I said, but you know what? I think this is temporary. This is my brain kind of readjusting. And so it's like memory wiped, and then it'll start to come back. And it was about three days, and the fourth day the memory started coming back. I did have huge fragments of my long-term memory that were just unavailable. Like if you would ask me, how you, uh, do you remember your kids when they were, say, six years old? And I'd go, no. But you know what? I remember when they were 12. It was very random. Hmm. So what I did was I started to look for natural alternatives. I have a sensitivity to any kind of pharmaceutical drugs, so I just don't bother. Go figure. At la and I am allergic to a lot of the antibiotics, so that didn't work. I went to the doctors, and I had a brain scan, and I had all kinds of tests, and they had a whole raft of prescription drugs for me. And I said, I looked at it. I had five prescriptions. I remember looking, and I said, wow, this is scary. If I take all this stuff, I'm never going to come out of this. I'm going to be a zombie. I'm going to end up in an extended care facility. So I chose not to fill them, and I just put it out there that, you know what, I need to look for natural alternatives. Started doing a little research, ended up taking a, a herb called echinacea, which actually can grow here in Alberta, and started to boost my immune system. And then had the amazing uh, opportunity to go to a presentation that was uh, occurring in the town that I lived in by a gentleman that I had not seen for many years. Uh, I'd taken Tai Chi from him in 1986 to 1988. This was now 1997. He was coming out and he was going to talk about Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is so cool, I'm going to go. And I went there, he remembered me from his class, and he did a technique that I have never experienced in my whole life. It's called pulsing, and it's a technique that the Chinese use to determine what the energy uh, lines are, where, not what they are, but what's happening in each of the energy lines. There's uh, a dozen lines going through the body, and there's 12 pulses. They do three on the surface and three deep on each of your wrists, and they just use their fingers. And Kenny, it was amazing. He told me everything. He even told me, he said, I think you've been in an accident. I think you had an injury that was in your neck and in your, in your brain. Uh, and then he started to describe some of the symptoms that I was experiencing, and I'm going, holy mackerel. I, I mean, I, I, at one point, this I literally called, this turned This is called around. pulsing? It's called, uh, yeah, Chinese pulse, Chinese. taking your pulse, taking your pulses, yep. Wow. And it was, I, I couldn't believe it. Like, I had been trained in science, so basically more Western science, Western medicine, and this was foreign to me, and yet I was blown away. At one point, I remember, I actually turned around, looked over my shoulder to see if somebody was feeding him cues, and I thought, how silly is that? Who would be able to feed him those cues other than my wife? And she wasn't behind me. So I, I just said, you know what? I believe everything happens for a reason. You were brought into my life to facilitate my healing, and let's do it. So I spent three years, because I could not work. I no longer could go back and be a teacher. It just wasn't going to happen. The brain was healing and wasn't very functional in the beginning. But I am grateful that I got the memory back, and I spent the next three years learning all about traditional Chinese medicine with this amazing man. His name is Victor Shim. His uh, company name now is called Ancient Alternatives, and just phenomenal. Um, I learned everything about traditional Chinese medicine, and I received treatments in the form of acupuncture, acupressure, cupping, and then I started to use some of his herbal formulas. And I credit his medicine and my persistence and tenacity and determination and desire to be well with the reason that I'm sitting here today. And it, uh, it took me three years. That's so amazing. Yeah, it was fun phenomenal, just phenomenal. And as a result, the time that I spent there, I worked with him and mainly uh, helping people understand what it was they were going to experience when they went for their pulses, a little bit about my own story so they could understand why I was there. And it, it just worked out beautifully because I became the go-between. People would go in, have their pulses done. They'd come out and they'd say, so this is what Victor told me. I don't really understand. I'd say, okay, here's what it means. And here's what these formulas are. And then I'd give them a little feedback on how to take the formulas, if there were specific directions. And it was so rewarding to, to see 
those people come back and say, oh man, I'm, I'm healthy again. And what I discovered... So what are the, some, of, some of the things that you've seen uh, greatly benefited from natural Chinese herbs? What are some of the illnesses that you've Probably seen? Probably the three big experiences where there was a gentleman came in. He was in his early 30s. He was uh, from a, a local uh, Hutterite community, and he had a brain tumor. And that brain tumor was originally about the size of an orange, and it had shrunk a little bit. They could not operate because of the position of the brain tumor. And I remember him walking in, and a tall man, probably about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, but he was hunched, and he had his wife on one side and his dad on the other, and he looked like a walking zombie. It was, it was so bad, was scary. They had given him treatments for uh, shrinking the tumor with uh, radiation. He was taking chemotherapy. He was just a mess. And the prognosis was not good. It was that he was going to pass away. So he came to see Victor. Victor took his pulses. And Victor, the one thing that I admire most about Victor is that he always gave people hope. And he just said, do you, do you want to live? And he said, yes, I want to live more than anything else. He said, okay, then that's what we're going to work on, that premise. And this guy ended up getting some uh, acupressure treatments, but he basically put him on one of the more powerful herbal formulas. He gave him some suggestions as to how to change his diet, uh, more whole foods and uh, pure foods, no uh, processed stuff, and drinking pure water. Kenny, it was amazing. Like four months later, that guy came in again, and he was the picture of health. He had gone for a scan, and the tumor was now down to the size of uh, a large marble, wow. and the doctors were absolutely <clears throat> mystified at how it could have happened. Long story short, another three more months, and it was completely gone, and he regained all his health back. He didn't lose any of his mental capacity or functions. It was fantastic. Was, was the tumor cancerous? Yes. Yeah, it was a, uh, it was a malignant tumor, and the prognosis from the medical community that it would eventually have killed him. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, from was, herbs, from natural herbs. Yeah, from using, uh, basically modifying his diet and using this herbal formula. Another gentleman came in. He had hepatitis. Uh, I don't remember if it was hep A or hep B, but one of those two. Uh, his liver was shutting down. He was yellow. Uh, jaundiced. Yeah, very jaundiced. And his doctor had actually told him, you need to go talk to your family and make arrangements because you probably have less than three months. And he came in with his wife, and he was in his uh, mid-50s. He looked like he was probably in his mid-90s. And again, part of it was to, to this gentleman had had uh, issues with uh, alcohol in the past, and that had caused a, a bigger problem. So the first thing that Victor said is, you know, do you understand that you can't drink ever again? If we're going to work with you, we need you to be clean. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm done. I'm absolutely done. And he said, so what I'm going to suggest are some changes in your lifestyle, in your diet, and a herbal formula, a couple of herbal formulas, actually. And I sat down with him after and explained it, and I told his wife what he should be doing. And uh, again, it was absolutely amazing. He came in. It was probably a good six months till I saw that fellow. But he came in, and again, when he first came in, his wife was holding him up, kind of bracing him. He was shuffling. He, he just looked like he was ready for the Ready coffin. for the grave, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and that, that was all completely transformed into a man who had vibrancy again. He was healthy. He came in, and this is the thing that was amazing. The doctor tested him three times, and the hep was gone. And yet, the doctor said that. That was not curable. So the hep was gone, the jaundice was gone, the liver was restored, and this gentleman had a, a new lease on life. Also, you can really tell that the doctor's belief systems aren't always correct. You know, there's no other ways it's, around it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's But it's only what they're taught. Exactly, right? and so. I don't ever judge them. It's, it's what they know, it's what they're taught. I chose a, a, a natural path for healing, and the people that I interacted with came to Victor because they also had found that the uh, Western medicine was not going to work for them. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not that Victor is uh, against or I'm against Western medicine, but there's a place for it. And where it works the best is when there's trauma, like if you break your leg or you cut yourself open, absolutely. You know, get the doctor to reset the leg, put a cast on, 
I put stitches in. But then the healing process is much more effectively addressed if you use traditional or natural medicine. And actually in China, Kenny, what they do now is a lot of the hospitals, they have two parts to the hospital. One part is dedicated to Western medicine, and they do the types of things that ours doctors do in resetting legs, performing surgery. And then immediately upon coming out of that, they go to the other part of the hospital, and this is where they use traditional Chinese medicine, where they will uh, have them go through acupressure, acupuncture, herbal treatment. Well, uh, just to take a quick break from, from your story, uh, you know as well as I know because we watched it together, I just want to plug this to our listeners. Uh, Greg Braden, how he has, when he does that talk, when he is in Italy, uh, he does a talk and he shows on there, you can find it on YouTube, uh, how there's medicineless hospitals mm-hmm. in China and they healed uh, bladder cancer using nothing but intention where three, uh, three practitioners would come in and they would do a chant and they would generate from their heart center a feeling of this person being healthy, that they were already healed, that there was no uh, illness inside of her. And they do this chant and literally within three minutes, they show it real time uh, how they healed, uh, they sh- shrunk this golf ball size uh, cancerous tumor in, in this person's bladder to nothing and it disappears before your eyes they they showed it with uh an ultrasound they had a uh, and they had they had it have it right there like you guys could check this out on youtube like check out greg braden uh medicineless hospital and it will blow you away i just want to put that in that's but, awesome and yes yeah. i watched it i saw it and i understand it uh i i believe that it's all about energy <clears throat> and it's the energy of the herbs it's the energy of the treatment and I also became very, very interested in energy work. Uh, I took um, Reiki right up to level three and then just studied with a master. And I absolutely believe that it's all about energy. We are really just a form of energy. And if you can get in alignment with that vibration, that energy of healing, it happens. And I saw that very thing that you did describe, and it was amazing. I mean, you actually watched this tumor shrinking before your eyes. And yeah. that is really taking us into a, a whole new realm of medicine. Whole new realm of life and understanding about everything. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I agree 100%. And uh, I know that for me, the energy that is associated with acupressure, which basically is a type of massage where you put pressure on certain points, but Victor had a stipulation that anybody that did acupressure with him had to learn how to move energy. So he would train them with Tai Chi and Qi Kong. And then you had to learn how to move that energy through your body so that when you were doing the actual acupressure, you were not only hitting that acupuncture point, and that's where you're going for them, but you're also projecting energy in. And again, like you said, it's that heartfelt energy. Uh, the energy of love, the energy of compassion, healing. It's, it's all that vibration. And I saw many, many people benefit hugely just from simple acupressure treatments. And I knew that a huge part of that aspect was the energy that the practitioner was also putting in. So like Reiki, so you actually performed Reiki on people to, yes. to benefit them? Yes. Yep. Um, what's your most memorable experience with that? Probably the most memorable experience was a family member. One of my um, favorite fellows was my brother-in-law. He was a trucker. He had a lot of problems with his hands. And of course, he would have them on the, the uh, steering wheel for long periods of time, and then they took a real beating, loading and unloading stuff, and he had a lot of pain in his hands, and he tried a whole bunch of different things, and nothing seemed to work. And I said one time, well, why don't you come and I'll do a a session with you and and I'll really focus on your hands. I'll do a a reflexology and some acupressure and then just some energy work on that. And he said, well, that'd be great. So I remember doing that for about an hour and he fell asleep. He was so relaxed, he fell asleep. And again, just did a little bit of reflexology, a little bit of acupressure and just focusing on putting energy in. 
that and like without, intention yeah intention so, basically so you, you set like, an intention that this energy and with it there's no expectation and that's a really really important part of it kenny is that you give that energy basically unconditionally without expectation you're i i just say you know what i give this energy freely and whatever his body mind and spirit are supposed to do with it so be it wow. and he woke up sat up i remember him sitting up and i remember him flexing his hands and he looked at me and he said, what did you do? And I said, a little bit of everything. Why? He said, I have no pain wow. in my hands at all. That's so cool. And what I did then was I taught him how to continue that process through meditation and to send energy to his hands. I did probably about three more sessions with him. And he said the pain came back, but probably less than 20%. And I thought, wow. And he said that uh, when he was diligent and he did do that meditation with intention of bringing positive energy in, he said he, he reported that he felt better. It, there actually was a benefit. So, yes, uh, I mean, belief is a huge part of it. Is yeah, like if somebody goes into it and they think it's bullshit and it's not going to work, yeah. then there's less chance of it yeah. having a positive effect. Right? I call it all BS anyway, right? And my take on BS is, is stands for our belief stories, our belief system. Everything we make up, it's all BS anyway. And I never, ever, ever judge a person's BS, but I will ask them one question. Is that getting you the results you want? How's that working for you? And if they say, oh, it sucks, man. It's, I said, hey, here's good news. You changed the BS. All of it can be reprogrammed. You just sounded like Matthew McConaughey. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. See, if I go in, I, I don't even know when I do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So, um, Reiki, so that's, wow, that's energy work. You're somewhat of a, of a shaman and to me anyways, I've called you that numerous yeah. times. I know you never fucking admit to it, but, uh, <laughs> I don't admit to a lot of labels. The only label that I'm ever comfortable with is a facilitator, because for me, that means that I'm assisting somebody, empowering somebody, guiding somebody, uh, facilitator or mentor. I'm okay with those shaman. I kind of think of the process. I think there are a lot of people, I consider myself on a shamanic path which is a path dedicated towards promoting uh, reverence for life, promoting healing. Uh, that's more my alignment rather than a term called a shaman. Uh, I would admit that I'm on a shamanic path, and I think there's lots of people that are on that path dedicated to promoting balance and harmony in life. Cool. That's so cool. So what did you do? Uh, let's, go, let's go into kind of where we met, what you were doing there. Okay. I'll give you the reason that I was so drawn to going to work in corrections. In uh, 1986 and 1987, I was teaching still at W.P. Wagner High School, but there was uh, an opportunity to go work out at the jail, uh, the Fort Saskatchewan, the old Fort Saskatchewan jail. Yeah. And they needed p teachers to go out to teach at a school that was out there during the summertime. And I loved it. And I loved the connection I had. Were you, were, first time you ever went into the jail, were you scared? Oh, I was excited. I was not scared at all. I was so excited by the possibilities. For me, uh, fear is the acronym false evidence appearing real. And I can push that aside and just turn it into an excitement. And I was excited. And I loved it. As a result of that, uh, back in 2014, I had the opportunity to work for the John Howard Society, and I got to work in the Edmonton Remand Center, where I met you yeah. and many other amazing people. And let me just say, uh, for the whole audience, that Kenny is one of the most inspirational testimonials, a walking testimonial of how you can transform your life, because Kenny, you did transform your life. Uh, I always say that I may be a catalyst, I may be able to provide the information, but it's the individual, their desire, their dedication, their commitment, that's what does it. And Kenny, you are definitely one of the people that exemplifies transformation more than anybody else. So. Well, thanks. Thanks, Howie. You, you taught me a lot of uh, tools to use to like maintain it. Uh, it. A big one for me, like I've said before, is like you got to set the intention, right? So right. before my intentions were misconstrued and I, I didn't really have a set path, uh, one of the things that Howie taught me, which was really huge right when I first met him, is uh, 
what do you want people to say at your funeral? And it was a little exercise that we had to come up with our own, uh, what's it called? A eulogy. A eulogy. I was going to say obituary, but that's in the newspaper. A eulogy. So we had to write our own eulogy. And when you really think about that, it's like, you know, what do you want your children to say about you and your friends? And like, what what kind of legacy do you want to leave for yourself? And uh, I, I didn't want people to say, oh, this guy was a, a gangster, he hurt people, or he was involved in crime, or... Like I, I wanted people to say, like this guy was a, an amazing person and and gave back and dedicated his life to helping others, uh, th- through their struggles or whatever, and, and and it really got my 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 gears turning and my definitely cranked on a few heartstrings that one exercise, and and from there it was just honestly for, to get to that point was the whole uphill battle, uh you know like. Being a gangster is not easy. It's, it's not. It, it's a constant struggle. There's always things going wrong because you're putting out a shit energy yeah. and you're getting shit back in your life. And uh, you're in a constant whirlwind of, of trouble and trauma and people around you dying and ODing and going to jail and uh, being separated from their family or hurt or assaulted. Like there, there's so many uh, negativities around that lifestyle. And uh, is it really worth it for, for an ego boost? You know, uh, but once I once I <clears throat> started making these intentions and doing these exercises with Howie, uh, I st- it, it all became a downhill slide after that because now with like the right mindset, and, and it's not like it's perfect by any means, but it, it, it's hell of a lot better than it used to be. But now I just noticed that things in my life are just kind of falling into place without the constant struggle. And uh, having good intentions is, is a big part of that. And you told me that. So I really owe, you, owe that to you, man. Thank you so much. You're very <clears> welcome. <throat> and again, I always say I'll take 20% credit. 80% credit goes to you because you did experience transformation. And I have to say a number of your fellow uh, gentlemen in ERC did the same. And it's all based on our. you get to that point when you decide, you know what, I've had enough of this. I do want to change. The desire is there. The intention is there. And then if you use the tools, take the proper actions and just stay focused, stay on it, it's all achievable. So, you know, you did something great. Uh, can you can you tell them about the idea that you had, uh, how it came about and and the program that you started in there in order to start shaping and changing these uh, incarcerated individuals' lives? Sure. It was actually... Uh, in the boot camp unit, One Alpha, I had just delivered the John Howard Society program, which was an amazing program, still is an amazing program. And I went back the next week to just do a little bit of follow-up, and three individuals that were in my class came up and said, you know what, Howie, we would love to continue this positive energy that has been generated through that course. Do you have another course? Could you teach us something else? And I said, you know, it's interesting. I've been putting together a personal development course. It's not in any really definitive uh, form, but it's something that could be a work in progress and I could continue to work on it. I said, would you be interested in doing something like that? And they said, absolutely. I said, okay, so what I'll do is I'll come in once a week and I will just facilitate some of the topics. And these are topics that are aimed at not only personal development, but transformation, changing who you are. And we started and very quickly we said, well, we have to call this something. And I came up with an acronym, PEAK. Initially it was positive energy and knowledge. And then it got changed by one of the individuals who said, but you always told us it's always about taking that energy and taking that knowledge and applying it. And I said, you're right. We have to change one of those letters. So it became positive energy, action and knowledge. And then I put a little tag on the end of it to empower. And empower is I-M-P-O-W-E-R, which means I am power if you read it, and it stands for internally manifested power. Because I truly believe that real power is right here inside you. All of us have it. And this course, what it was aimed at, what was peak, all about unleashing that power. First of all, making you aware that you had it. Second is holding you accountable for all of it. Everything you created, you did it. But the good news is you get some new tools, some new strategies, and you can change that. It's all possible. And PEAK took off uh, onto both units called Boot Camp in 
ERC, very successful. I did it there for almost four years. And then we decided we would try it on the street. And I have you and a number of uh, amazing people that I call my peak ambassadors to thank for that. We went to the public library and actually uh, Kenny was the one who took the initiative to get us into the library. We were given a, a room, a program room, and we presented every week for the next four months. And the library was absolutely ecstatic. They said we were probably one of the most successful programs that had ever gone through the library. I got to uh, experience a connection to people that weren't necessarily connected to the Remand Center. Many of the people that came into the PEAK program were just people who had heard about it or even off the street. We had people walk, literally walk in off the street, sit down and just take in what we're doing. And the program was free. It was designed to be open to anybody who wanted to experience positive change or transformation. And now I am rewriting the program with a much bigger dream of going back into the Remand Center with a, an actual program. It would be a two-week program. If, uh, if our listeners want to check any of it out on Facebook or on YouTube, you can search Peak to Empower. There's a couple of videos, and you can see a video of Howie facilitating some stuff. Uh, on our Facebook, uh, if you just search Peak, the number two, I am power.ca, it'll come up. You can check us out on awesome. there. And again, <clears throat> big thank you to Kenny for creating that Facebook account. He's done an amazing job. He is a wizard when it comes to social media. No, no, I'm really not. I'm really not. But uh, one of the cool things uh, about the program that really caught my attention and, and resonated deep with me, like I, I believed in it as soon as I heard it. I knew I heard it somewhere else. And But it was about the subconscious mind. And, and there are certain exercises that we did to almost retrain uh, our belief systems and our subconscious mind in order to uh, manifest like a certain aspect or, or thing or, or or something in our lives, like make some sort of change, make it happen. But uh, you want to explain like maybe a couple of things that we do to work with changing the belief system in the subconscious mind? Absolutely. <clears throat> and that's what the whole program is based on. Peak is based on recognizing, first of all, what your limiting beliefs are, and again, I call it all BS, your belief stories. We create stories based on experiences that we have. We are literally uh, perception interpretation machines. Uh, through our perception and our interpretation, we create a story. More often than not, that story gets locked into our belief system, which again, more BS, and that becomes who we believe we are when in fact it is probably based on misperception, misinterpretation, and tends to be limiting, restrictive, and sometimes just generally harmful. So my work in psychology taught me that the subconscious mind is really the true power. We have a subconscious and we have a conscious. Some people divvy it up a little bit differently, but it really doesn't matter. The conscious mind, the one that's operating when you're awake, it only represents about 10% of what's going on in your brain. Wow. The subconscious mind, is where the power lies. And the subconscious mind is a very interesting aspect of us because the quality that makes the subconscious mind create beliefs and lock them in is the quality that it does not recognize the difference between what we vividly imagine and what is actually real and true. So, for example, if I convince myself that I am really, really good at something, and I keep instilling that over and over, and I visualize that, and I start to feel that, I actually can create that. And the example that I would use, for most of my life, I carried anywhere from 50 to 80 extra pounds. At my heaviest, I'm only five foot five, at my heaviest- Same height as me. <laughs> yeah, I was 240 pounds. And wow. I tried all the diets. I tried all kinds of different plans, exercise. At one point, I think I dropped 40 pounds. I was in great shape. And then it was a matter of time. I gained it back even more. So at one point, I, gained, I got up to 240 pounds. And I realized that I wasn't changing the core beliefs that I had that were related to that. And I also discovered that, and again, this is my BS, and that's how I always qualify it. I also discovered that I was using food in a way that someone would label as addictive. What was your crack cocaine? My crack cocaine was rice pudding. <laughs> yep, rice pudding. And I also discovered that 
it didn't matter what that substance was. So if I was using crack cocaine, or if I was using heroin, or if I was using alcohol, me eating that pudding did the very same thing that all those other substances did. And they stimulate a part of the brain. It releases dopamine. You got it. And we feel good. It's about bringing pleasure. It's about getting rid of pain. So once I understood that, I realized, holy mackerel, there is only one addiction. Here's my BS. The only addiction that I believe every human being is seeking is to experience pleasure and diminish pain. We use rice pudding, heroin, crack cocaine, marijuana, whatever you want to call it. That substance is merely a means to an end. It's the way that we get that pleasurable feeling and or diminish that pain. I thought, wow, that's a very powerful driving force. We need to understand that. And once you understand that the subconscious is open for reprogramming, if you understand the strategies to get that conscious brain to shut down or to at least diminish and to open up that barrier, there is a filter, if you will, between the conscious and the subconscious. It's been labeled the critical faculty. And it's what prevents information from really going through and being accepted immediately. Some does, but some doesn't. So if I said, Kenny, you are an excellent cross-country skier. Have you ever cross-country skied? Never. Okay. So your chances of you believing that are? Slim to none. You got it. Exactly. However, if I find a way to lower that critical faculty and to suspend the critical conscious mind for a while and access the subconscious directly, it is going to believe whatever I put in there. So if I can get that belief in there and then follow it up with visualizations of you actually cross-country skiing, the feeling of what that would be like, I can actually develop that into your BS, new BS, that would eventually lead you to, you know what, I'm going to try cross-country skiing. And lo and behold, you'd be into it, and if you continue to reinforce it, you would become that very thing that at one point you never knew you could become. And I did that with weight. I tried so many things, and then I said, you know what? I am going to use a technique of autosuggestion is what I call it. Best way to label it is autosuggestion. It's a, it's a, if you will, could be akin to a form of self-hypnosis. Hypnosis, autosuggestion, and deep meditation have all been shown to diminish the influence of the conscious mind and to lower that critical faculty, which gives you direct access. So I learned this technique actually from a lovely little lady who called herself a hypnotherapist and a, conscious, a subconscious programmer. Uh, she's passed on. Her name was Dorothy Luck, amazing lady. She taught me some simple techniques, and she said, we're going to call it autosuggestion because a lot of people have some concerns about the word hypnosis. I said, hey, doesn't matter to me. Autosuggestion sounds great. And in this technique, all you're doing is going through a process of relaxing your body, putting yourself into a very light, sleep-like state. A theta state? Yes, and you change the brave brain waves, absolutely. And now what you've done is you've quieted the subcon- or you've quieted the conscious mind. You have lowered the critical faculty, and basically it's like opening a set of doors, and the conscious is sitting there, go, "Yo, what do you want? <laughs> I'm here. Just tell me what you want. Doesn't matter if it's crazy or whatever. I take it as it is. <laughs> whatever you say, I'm gonna believe it because that's the way I work. That's just it." And I thought that would be a crazy kind of voice to have for the subconscious mind, but that's what it is. And that's true. What I started to do then was to program a new information. And I created two affirmations. Affirmations are positive statements that you want to achieve. They're written in the first person, present tense, positive form. So I'm going to share what I said. Two simple affirmations. First affirmation was, I am healthy. I make healthy food choices. I am the master of my appetite. Now, in the beginning when I was saying that, little voice inside goes, BS, man, that's a crock, that's not true. You know what? It is BS, but it's the new BS. And guess what? I'm going to keep saying this till you believe it. It took probably the better part of a month before I started to feel that. And then as I felt it... Until you felt like the resistance yes, kind of faded away? Yes, that it's diminishing. Yeah. And then what I did was I had a photograph that became a mental picture, too, of what I looked like when I weighed about 175 pounds. And at this point, just so you know, I was pushing about 240 pounds. Big, big dude. 
I said, that's what I'm going to say before I go to bed at night and when I get up in the morning. Because just before you go to bed, do the exercise to relax yourself. First thing in the morning, just relax yourself. That's when your subconscious is most active. And so what I did was I said that statement and I said, I thought, you know what? I'm going to really test the subconscious. I'm going to say, I weigh 175 to 180 pounds. I'm going to program that in. I did that, Kenny, for seven months. Seven and a half months I got on the scale. I weighed 175 pounds. Wow. And I felt fantastic. The cool thing is, is that happened in 2011. So that's I never gained it back. I actually took it a step further and decided I was going to so even So that's take 65 pounds. Yep. And I took it even further to take it even down further. I did a, a fast, but I also reprogrammed again. I want to weigh, and this is what I said, I want to weigh what I weighed when I got married. And I didn't even remember exactly until I looked it up. I weighed 155 pounds. I sit in front of you right now weighing 155 pounds. I started at 240. Yeah, we're both the same size. And you know what? It's never coming back. Because why? I reprogrammed the BS. The new BS is you weigh it. Kenny, I can now eat a bowl of rice pudding. I don't have the same relationship with that. But people say, well, you're just going to put weight on. No, it doesn't. What happens now is that my subconscious, which can control my metabolic rate, will actually burn everything up, and I stay at 155 pounds. Just because it's ridiculously impressive, how long did you fast for? I did a water fast with just uh, purified water and uh, supplements for 15 days. 15 days with no food? Correct. And you didn't die? You will not die unless you have some serious health issues or unless you are already very compromised in terms of weight. It was amazing. Tell everybody why you decided. I did it for two reasons. One is... I had done some research, and it was a way to kind of reset your body. Second was the belief now that contributes to conditions, uh, health conditions like diabetes or even liver problems is that there is fat that now deposits around the pancreas and around the liver. The research that I studied said the only way you can get rid of that internal fat is through fasting. And there is a doctor, Dr. Jason Fung, in Toronto that has a whole clinic that runs basically on intermittent fasting and long-term fasting. And he said unequivocally, if you're prepared to do at least 14 days of a water fast with supplements, you will digest away. It's called autophagy. Basically, your body starts to eat itself, but it's very selective. The fat that you have in there that is around the pancreas and around the liver is a very high concentrated fat it goes right for it and it will start to digest it all the way yeah because what i learned in personal training is that uh your fat is a higher source of kcal energy and it's actually the the best source like carbohydrates uh you get per gram of carbohydrate you get four kcals and per gram of fat you get nine kcals of energy so it's over double exactly and so basically i just said to my body i know you want this I'm going to give you an opportunity because I'm not giving you anything else. All you got is fat. And of course, it does also break down the fat that's on the surface, the the outer body fat. The visceral fat. The visceral fat, exactly. But it, when you don't have anything, the higher quality and higher concentration of fat is inside around those organs. And that's what improved hugely for me. I also have type 2 diabetes as a result. I didn't say this, but as a result of the accident that I experienced when I got the brain infection, it affected a part of my brain that's controlling sleep. I ended up with central sleep apnea, not the type that you use the CPAP machine for. That's obstructive. So I couldn't use a CPAP machine. I use meditation more than anything for sleep. But when you have long-term sleep deprivation, one of the possibilities, which... I developed was type 2 diabetes. And again, type 2 is the type that you develop. Uh, My diet wasn't great, but it wasn't so poor that I should have gotten it. I can tell you, Kenny, just through the fast, there's a measure that they call it an AC1. It's basically a measure of the sugar content in your blood. And I was sitting consistently for months at about 10.3 to 10.5. Is that bad or good? It's not good. You it's want good. to be somewhere That's... between four and seven. That's the ideal. Okay. So I was high. Now, my doctor said to me, you hit 11, 
uh, we got to do some serious stuff. Right after that fast, I had it done uh, about two weeks after, and my AC1 was 6.7. My doctor almost fell so out. He went of his from chair. diabetic to not diabetic and that's through what he fasting. Said. Yeah, he said, "You've basically wow. taken yourself out of the zone." And this is a very viable way for people who have type two diabetes to start to reverse it and get it under control. That is fucking amazing. Yeah, it is. That amazing. is the best way ever to end this show. We're we we ran out of time. I wish we had more time to keep discussing how you're a book of knowledge. You just provided me again with so much value just sitting here re, uh, hearing this stuff again. I appreciate you so much. Thanks for coming out. And uh, like I look forward to how he's definitely going to be back, guys, because he's just full of these life hacks and good things to teach you guys and tell you and provide value in your lives. Uh, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank everybody for, for listening. Just remember if you're listening to this, you're, you're part of our lion's pride. You are a lion. Uh, you know, share, share this content. If you, if you found anything valuable in it, share it, get it out there. Uh, we're just here to contribute positively to the ebb and flow of life. But, uh, I want to give a shout out to, uh, Liam Connolly at Connolly law. Uh, for all your Canadian law and will estates. Uh, if you have any media issues, uh, check out Liam Connolly Law. Give him a, uh, Google him. Uh, please go to uh, our Patreon page. And uh, if you have any suggestions for nonprofits that we should sponsor, uh, just plug it into our Patreon page. That's uh, www.patreon.com slash life on life's terms. And... Uh, yeah, that's that's about it for the show. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for for listening and thank you Howie again for coming out. Kenny and Justin, thank you so much for this opportunity. I think this is an awesome way to uh, just get the word out and get the information out. Thank you. Thanks guys. See you later.